Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, I will talk today about um, a refactoring on Cumulus that I've been working on for quite some time now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Sebastian. I've been with Parity for yeah uh, around a year now, and I'm working on the SDK Node team and mostly on Cumulus-related topics. So yeah, today we will talk about yeah, a few different things. First, we will talk about what is a collator and what do we actually want to split? Because like uh, I'm saying, we want to yeah, divorce the relay and the parachain node inside of the collator. So what does it even mean? What do we want to split here? Um, then we will discuss the implementation, like the road towards the split. Um, what could it, considerations do we have to do? And what does the final result look like? And finally, we will take a look at how can I benefit from this and how to use the result. So first, a bit of context. Um, I think many of you probably have seen this yeah, super high-level diagram of Polkadot architecture. So right in the middle, we have the relay chain, which is uh, Polkadot. And on the outsides, we have different parachains. And for, for each parachain, some validators are assigned. And then where the pink dot is, this is what we are going to talk about. These are the collators. So what does the collator do? The collator is part of the parachain network. And basically, it gathers some transactions uh, from users of the parachain. And then the job of this collator is yeah, to gather them. And when the time is right, the collator will assemble a block candidate from these transactions and send the block candidate to some validators of the relay chain. It's only a candidate because the validators and the relay chain will perform a lot of validation on this block. And if the block is valid, um, eventually it will be included in the relay chain. How is this related to Cumulus? Like, what is Cumulus and what does it have to do with the collator? So, the formal requirements to be a collator are fairly low. So, as long as you can provide some block candidate or a collation, um, you can be a collator. So, you could, if you manage to assemble some shell script that does this, you are fine too. But in most cases, you want to build a collator that is based on substrate. And in that case, we provide basically a template that you can start from. It has all the required logic to be a parachain collator, and it's based on substrate. And if you want to start, you can just yeah, take this template, modify it to your needs, and you have a nice starting point. If you want to experiment, you can just go to GitHub to the Cumulus project, fork it, or yeah, just clone it, build it, and play around. What do we actually want to split? So as we have seen previously, the block candidate that is sent to Polkadot, how it is actually done is that inside the collator binary, we not only have the parachain node that is assembling the candidate, but we also have a full Polkadot node inside of uh, this collator. The parachain node is part of the parachain network communicating to its peers, and the Polkadot node is part of the Polkadot network. Each of these are full substrate nodes, so they have the typical components that you would find, like the runtime, the network, and also some other components like consensus mechanisms. And in Polkadot, we also have subsystems. These subsystems are interesting for this talk, and we will later go into detail uh, why they are actually relevant here. So let's imagine we are running one of these collators, and yeah, Everything is fine. We are enjoying life. But then a new release of Polkadot comes along. And what we find is, yeah, it's a high priority release. Some new host functions have been added. And what it says, um, you need to switch to this new release before the new runtime arrives at your collator. So we have previously seen that the 
Polkadot-Node is part of the collator, so this forces us to do something and upgrade our code. This is actually pretty inconvenient. We are basically, from the outside, forced to modify our collator. And it would be nice if we had some way around that and yeah, basically avoid this inconvenience. So the idea is to refactor the node so that the Polkadot upgrade can actually be done by just replacing the Polkadot binary and not having to touch the collator at all. And the way towards this is that instead of running the Polkadot node in process, we would basically just run it outside and do this as a data source for our collator. So um, from a naive perspective, this could yeah, look something like this. On the left, we would have the Polkadot node with all the components that we have seen before. And on the right, we have the parachain node. They would be separate processes, and in between, we would just exchange some data via RPC. Simple enough. Um, I think uh, we will discuss some of the implementation details and considerations that you have to take um, in the next chapter, which is uh, implementation. So in the status quo, when I, when I started to work on this, we basically had the yeah, Polkadot node um, in process. And from the parachain side, we were just calling into this like a normal dependency. There was no clear abstraction layer. And yeah, the, the boundaries were not super clear. So first, we should analyze which components of the parachain node actually use relay chain data. Like, I don't know. What, what components do we have? What data do they need? And is it available via RPC? So can we easily extract it out? What we should do is investigate this. So a general thing to know about this is that a lot of systems in Substrate and also in the parachain node um, operate on notification streams. So when a new notification comes in, for example, an import block notification, or a finalization notification, we want to do something with it. Uh, many components are driven this way. So I see some new finalized block. Maybe I need to yeah, notify some network participants. Maybe I want to update some internal cache. Yeah, and this is, this is true for the parachain node as well. Um, overall, there are three major components inside of Cumulus that um, rely on the relay chain data. And the first one is the candidate production. So when the time is right, we want to produce this candidate. And inside of the candidate, we include some relay chain data that is later used to um, validate this block. And to do this, we require runtime calls. And the relay chain data is, in, um, is uh, included in form of a storage proof. We also talk here about the collation generation subsystem. Um, this subsystem is part of the in-process Polkadot node, and it tells us when exactly we should produce a relay chain block. This subsystem might be a bit unclear at this point, but we will go into, uh, into details later about these. So these are the interactions. And what about this is actually available via RPC? On the left, you see the RPC calls that we can use to fetch this data. So runtime calls, no problem. We can do this via RPC. Reading storage items, too. And storage proofs, we can also fetch via RPC. However, the interaction with this collation generation subsystem, this is not easily extractable. Next, we have parachain consensus. Inside of Cumulus, we have this um, yeah, called parachain consensus mechanism where we basically finalize parachain blocks based on what we see in a notification stream from the relay chain. So when we receive a new finalized block notification, we will take a look what is the parachain head at this situation, and then we finalize the given parachain head. The same we do with um, the best blocks. Here we just listen to notification streams, and we do runtime calls. We are fine. This is available via RPC. And the last 
component that uses relay chain data is proof of validity recovery. What is it and when do we use it? So if you assume that there's a malicious collator inside of your network that doesn't announce any blocks, but it still submits a valid block to the relay chain, this parachain block could get included and the other collators wouldn't know about it. So in that case, we want to have a mechanism for the collators to recover parachain blocks from the relay chain. And we do this by listening to the incoming relay chain blocks via a notification stream. And if we find that there is a parachain block that we actually don't know about, we send a recovery request to a subsystem that is called availability recovery. Let's see. The RPC calls um, are the same as before, so we want to listen to the imported and finalized notification streams. But what we don't see here is that um, the interaction with the subsystem um, is again like a problem. Let's talk about it. Like uh, the subsystems that I have mentioned before, um, they are part of the internal Polka.node. What is a subsystem? Um, the subsystems in Polkadot handle a lot of the internal logic and also of the parachain-related logic. Um, they are basically similar to an actor model. So every subsystem has a fixed task that it should work on, and it receives a message that it will yeah, then react on. And the subsystems um, between each other, they will also communicate via message passing. And overall, all of these subsystems are also driven by notification streams from the node. So the functionality of these subsystems is kind of split. Um, there are some subsystems that provide necessary logic for the collator, like the collation generation that we have talked about and also the availability recovery. So if this functionality needs to stay inside of the collator, how can we get away with splitting off this parachain node? The idea is that we identify which subsystems are actually used inside of the collator, like which functionality is still required, and then we spawn a Polkadot node that has all of the parts that we need, but throws away everything else. So we don't want to have a runtime. We don't have, uh, want to have grandpa and babe. We just want to run the subsystems that are required. Therefore, we basically need to take a look which subsystems these are. These are all subsystems in Polkadot, but not of all of them are relevant. Basically, the node only directly talks, the parachain node only talks directly to these three subsystems, collation generation, availability recovery, and the collator protocol. But yeah, including these three is not enough. Because as I've mentioned, they communicate via message passing. So if collation generation sends a message to some other subsystem, this subsystem too needs to be available. So we need to include the dependencies of these three subsystems in, the, um, in this minimal Polkadot node. To find out which are the dependencies, we should take a look at the message passing flow that is at effect here. Here we see the, um, yeah, here we see the flow. And there are basically two main use cases. The first one is um, candidate production use case. So at the top, we see the collation generation subsystem. Basically, when a new relay chain block comes along, this subsystem will check, do we currently have space, or do we currently want to accept a new candidate? If yes we will ask the parachain node to produce a candidate block for us, and the collation generation will receive it. The collation generation subsystem will then call the collator protocol to send this collation to the relay chain for us. So the collator protocol will find out who are the current, uh, currently to our parachain assigned validators, and it will advertise our collation to them, and it will also send the collation to these validators. This is done via subsystems that are called uh, the network bridge. This is basically an abstraction 
above the substrate network and yeah, imports the network functionality into this uh, subsystem world, basically. Also, we have a runtime API subsystem that allows us to get info from the runtime. And the second message flow is basically this availability recovery mechanism. So whenever we see a block that, uh, like in an import notification that we are not aware about, we will notify availability recovery to recover this block for us. Then availability recovery will find out which validators to talk to and will ask them to provide us with a chunk for this um, parachain block. If we have enough chunks, we can reconstruct the parachain block and import it in our parachain. Ah, I was too fast. So we need basically these six subsystems. So overall, what is the architecture that we yeah, basically want to have? We want to have a clear abstraction, and this is uh, in place in Cumulus now. We have basically a trait that is um, being an abstraction about the data source. So here we see, for example, we have a method to fetch some validators. We can fetch the best block hash, and we can register a finaliz finality notification stream. This is everything the parachain node sees at this point. So we don't care where this data comes from. It could come from the um, relay chain in process node, or it could come from a remote RPC node. This is basically yeah, hidden now. Finally, we arrive at this architecture. Um, we have a Polkadot node on the outside where we listen to notification streams and where we do um, RPC calls to call into the runtime and fetch some other data. And this RPC client basically then forwards this data to the parachain node and at the same time at this minimal Polkadot node, which is only running the six subsystems that I have mentioned earlier. Everything else is stripped out. So if some new host functions are introduced, we are now immune to this because we will just replace the Polkadot binary and don't need to touch our collator code. So how do we use this? At the top, we see basically the command that was previously used. Like you can, and you can still do that, actually. Like um, we just start to Polkadot parachain. You give a, spe a chain spec for your parachain, and then minus minus, and in the end, you can specify some relay chain arguments, and you specify your relay chain, uh, chain spec. And now, if you want to have an external relay chain, you don't need to provide a chain spec, but you will basically point the node to the WebSocket endpoint of that um, external node, and then we, we will fetch the data from there. Um, but yeah, I want to give some recommendations for this, actually. Is like, um, you will be able to specify multiple URLs. So I recommend not to point everything to a single node. Um, we don't want to have single point of failures. So if this node goes down, we will switch to the second node that you have specified. Also, please run your own Polkadot node. We don't want 1,000 collators connected to some public Polkadot RPC. And if that goes down, uh, all the collators die. So you should still run your, some nodes of your own. And finally, um, this uh, internal minimal node can still be configured by these relay chain arguments. So if you use the command at the bottom and still specify some boot nodes, for example, for the relay chain node, then it will still pick those up. So you can add some network specification here. And overall, that's like this is one use case with the, uh, with the external full node. But since we are now abstracted, uh, have now abstracted away the data source, um, you could also hook this up to a light client, for example. If the RPC interface is the same, uh, then we can fetch data from it. And in the future, we could also look into like, integrating the light client directly into the collator and have basically a more lightweight collator than today. And that's it. Thank you. We'll now open it up for questions. Does anyone have any? Thank you. 
Thanks. Are there any latency concerns with that increase between having it local there with a fairly quick turnaround and having it pushed out to those RPCs? So currently, we are not experiencing any problems with this. Um, I've been running a node like this uh, in our internal test networks until now, and they don't cause any problems. So it, it seems to be fine. So what if those uh, subsist subsystems get updated in the Polkadot node, right? Yeah, I mean, the functionality that these uh, Polkadot subsystems provide, they are basically um, only used in the collator. So if there was some critical update to this protocol, then you would need to update. But actually, this is very rare, because there is basically a clearly defined interface between this. Like, yeah. The interface is the network messages that are being sent. So if these change, then you also need to update.